Summerfield, President of the Lake County Wine Grape Commission, and I would like to welcome you to today's seminar. This virtual seminar is being presented as a collaborative effort of UC Cooperative Extension, Lake County Department of Agriculture, Lake County Farm Bureau, and Lake County Wine Grape Commission. Now before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, all attendees have been placed on mute and during our session the chat function has been disabled. Uh, if you do have a question during the session, you may type it in the Q&A section. And if time allows at the very end, we will ask our speaker to address them. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Commission's website and you'll be sent a link to that um, after the seminar. So our speaker today is Dr. Cindy Cron. Dr. Cron works for UC Cooperative Extension as the Integrated Pest Management Advisor serving Lake, Mendocino, Napa, and Sonoma counties. She holds a BS degree in viticulture and enology with a minor in agricultural pest management and a PhD in entomology from UC Davis. And she continued on to complete a postdoc position as a research entomologist for the USDA ARS in the Crop Disease, Pests and Genetics Research Unit. So with that, please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Dr. Cindy Cron. I'm sharing my screen, give me one second. Okay, everything look good on your end? Okay, so um, today I'm talking about two invasive species um, that threaten grapevines um, in Lake County, but not just Lake County, um, in California as a whole. Uh, we're looking at brown marmorade stink bug and the spotted lantern fly. Um, and so why are we talking about this today? Um, recently, and this was in May of this year, uh, we have traps out for brown marmorade stink bug in Lake County. Um, and we have two finds that you can see in Upper Lake. We have one find in um, a pear orchard uh, perimeter in Upper Lake and one uh, down in Kelseyville. Um, if you look at the map to the, to the left. So um, that is where this all started. Um, and in talking, it's the first finds of brown marmorid stink bug in Lake County. Um, and before we move forward into talking about brown, about brown marmorade stink bug, um, the research was made possible through funding through the California Pear Advisory Board um, and the Pear Pest Management Research Fund. This is a project that was started with Rachel Elkins and Lucia Varela uh, five years ago, uh, along with Chuck Ingalls, who was working out of Sacramento and the Delta area. Um, and it has continued on trapping uh, near pear orchards and um, in the effort to, to pick up on hitchhiking uh, brown marmorade stink bug that could be traveling um, into these areas. So they chose pear orchards in close proximity to very uh, heavy traffic trafficked areas uh, with cars. So near gas stations or near major intersections in the area. Um, so we've continued on this project. This year, the funding is uh, for Rachel Elkins, uh, Carrie Wimbel Rojas, Jalenda Rajal, and myself, uh, Cindy Cron. And we are um, IPM advisors in different um, areas. Jalenda is in Stanislaus County. Carrie is Yolo, Sacramento, Solano County. I handle Napa, Napa, Sonoma, Lake, and Mendocino, and Rachel Elkins is Emeritus uh, Pomology Advisor for Lake and Mendocino counties. So that is, is where this all started, um, and to, before we get into identification of these two species, um, why are invasive species such a big deal? And I get asked this question like, well, who, why, is, why is it such a big deal about invasive compared to you know, any other insect pest? And the issue is that an invasive species um, is not originally from here. And because of that, when it is introduced into a new environment, it is often introduced without its predators and its parasitoids that normally keep this insect in check in its native environment. The predators and parasitoids that we have here in California, because they did not 
develop these relationships over time usually do not recognize um, the new invasive species as a prey item um, and therefore the invasive species is often allowed to reproduce uh, in very large numbers uh, without being checked by your natural balances that you would have in the native um, environment. So uh, predators do not recognize it as prey and therefore they're allowed to reproduce without being predated on. And the numbers are able to increase um, unchecked. And so this is why invasive species are such a big deal um, and why uh, we are really concerned about these two in particular. Um, because they can, both of them um, do have grapes as a host. So let's get started with brown marmorite stink bug. Um, brown marmorite stink bug is, is native to Eastern Asia. It was first found in the United States and Pennsylvania. And that was back in 2001. So this is uh, approximately 19 years ago. Um, and it has since been documented in 46 states and four Canadian provinces. So in that period of time, it has moved to, um, it has dispersed to a very large area. Um, and it was first discovered in Los Angeles in 2006. And we did have a very large reproducing population in Sacramento and Yubu City in 2013. Um, so it's considered a serious agricultural pest. Um, because it does affect uh, different crops, such as fruits, vegetables, nuts, in addition to being a nuisance pest in urban areas. Um, so we will talk a little bit more about that in a later slide. So one of the issues with brown marmorite stink bug is that it has so many different host species, um, which means that it, it's able to move from one host to another host um, and always able really to find food and a place to reproduce. Um, an insect that has a very narrow host range is easier to control because then you can pinpoint what their specific hosts are. But brown marmorite stink bug has over 170 hosts. So that's very difficult to control. Um, pretty much it can move from crop to crop, different kinds of crops, again, between nuts and legumes and fruits um, to ornamental trees. Um, so it's very difficult uh, to try to pinpoint it that way. Um, so some of the list of some of the trees, uh, some of the crops, apple, pear, stone fruits, grapes, hazelnuts, pecans, almonds, blueberries, raspberries, peppers, soybeans, sunflower, eggplant, tomato, corn, and it goes on. So um, tree of heaven is an invasive tree, and we will talk a little bit more about tree of heaven later. Um, and it is also an invasive tree that's from China. Uh, and and um, it is, it's one of its preferred hosts. It's able to reproduce in high numbers on Tree of Heaven. Um, but in, in addition, some of the ornamentals are your princess tree, catalpa, English holly, southern magnolia, redbud, Chinese passage, crab apple. So there's, there's a wide range of host species that it can um, feed and reproduce on. So the photo on the left is showing you some uh, damage on an apple. Um, so when you, you'll see the divots in the outer skin, when you cut that back, you, you have this pithy area in which the um, stink bug uh, inserts its mouth parts um, and starts to feed from the inside and then um, it damages the fruit. And this is not really uh, marketable, the, the fruit. Um, so the adults, they aggregate in the fall on the sides of buildings or trees and they seek out structures to overwinter. This is where they become an issue in urban areas um, because of these aggregations and because they move into people's homes um, in the fall and winter time. In spring, those adults will move into the agricultural areas when it becomes warm and they feed and mate and lay eggs in agricultural areas. So we're looking at one to two generations per year in the mid-Atlantic states, although it's likely that it could be more than that in California due to our warmer climate here um, year round. So what does it look like? The, the point of the, uh, going over these species is to try to show you images of what it is um, that you're looking for to identify the species so that if you were to find this out in the field, you would be able to say, oh, that looks like brown marmorite stink bug. Maybe I, I need to submit this to see if this is a find or not. So uh, egg masses, on the left-hand side, you see egg masses are approximately 28 eggs, give or take. 
Um, they are clear to opaque uh, white. And when they get really close to emerging, they, the eggs, you can see this triangle that's cut in half um, uh, on the eggs right before their the, the first instar emerges. Uh, we have, it goes from eggs, five instars. So an instar is an immature stage. So it goes through five uh, immature stages and then emerges as an adult. So what we have here is a photo of the eggs. Um, the first instar has emerged. And when they first emerge, um, they have this black pattern. They're a yellowish green when they first emerge, but within a few hours, you'll see the photo to the right, they turn, they turn orange. And as they progress days uh, past, this orange will turn into like a reddish color. So um, this is the pattern that you would see in the first instar. They tend to be laid, the egg masses on the underside of leaves. So if you're looking up into a canopy, you should be able to see the egg masses on the underside of the leaves. Um, and they aggregate around um, their eggs as a first instar. They tend to stay around the eggs as a first instar. When they molt to become a second instar, that is when they usually disperse. So this is what you usually will find on the underside of a leaf. This is what, what they do, that's their behavior. Um, and that's what they look like. So the photo on the left, you still have the empty eggs. Um, and you have this first instar. You have your second instars. This is what a second instar looks like um, after it's molted. This is a newly molted second instar. The exoskeleton hasn't hardened yet, so it's a very light in color. But typically, after a couple hours, it's going to be darkened in black, like you see here. So the photo on the right, you're seeing what it looks like, the, the second instar up close. And some features are very noticeable in the beginning, starting with your second instar. You have the white banding on the antenna and on the, the legs and the hind legs. And the immature stage has these tiny projections in, in front of the eyes. Um, and we're gonna cover this again in a later photo. I'm gonna show this to you again, this feature. So as it moves on, you have your fifth instar here and you have your adult here. Um, again, white bands on the antenna, white bands on the legs. The adults have two white bands on the antennas. Um, and a very uh, broad band of white um, on the legs. And to show you what do all the life stages look like, remember I said eggs, five instars, and adult. We have in the center the egg mass, first instar, second instar, third instar, fourth instar, fifth instar, and an adult. So each time they molt, they get slightly larger, and there is a different pattern and coloration that you will see. Um, as they progress. And as you can see here, the fourth instar, they have wing pads. The wing pads get larger in the fifth instar. And basically what this is, is the development of what will later be as an adult, their wings. So those are the features you would look at, look at all the different life stages um, if you were to find them in the field. Um, so one of the things we talked about the behavior of aggregation and that being an issue with urban areas. And here's some photos of what an aggregation can look like. Um, it's not pretty. <laughs> so uh, you definitely don't want this in your home and you don't want it under your home or in your garage or in the area that they would try to hide to overwinter. Um, so this is what an aggregation of brown marmite stink bug looks like. So some identifying features. This is a good um, photo that points out some very important identifying features of brown marmite stink bug. They are approximately five eighths of an inch as an adult. So this is an adult. Adults have wings. The immature stages do not have full wings yet. You have the two white bands on the antenna. Very, very important because this is, distinguishes it from other species. Um, the shoulders here are smooth. And later I'm gonna show you what mm, shoulders that aren't smooth look like so you understand better what I mean by this. But they're not jagged. It's a smooth, rounded shoulder here. Um, which is one of its features that is, uh, distinguish it from some native species I'm going to show you later. So the forward um, portion of the head here is blunt, so it's a flat blunt, there's no projections, um, and they have a banded abdominal edge um, on the sides. So the older nymphs um, also have the white bands on the antenna and on the, the legs. You see this white band that's wide. It also has the spine in front of the eyes. You remember I pointed 
that out in a second instar. Um, so you see the spine, which is the projection that's right in front of the eye. Um, and so moving forward, when you're in the field, I wanted to show you some photos of um, native stink bugs that we have um, that belong here, um, that are native, um, to be able to distinguish between, do I have brown mermaid stink bug or am I looking at a native species? So there's three that are really close lookalikes. Um, they're called, you know, BMSB lookalikes. And on the right-hand side of a picture, typical picture of brown mermaid stink bug adult. And on the left is the conspur stink bug. And how are these two different? Well, brown mermaid stink bug adults are approximately five eighths of an inch. Conspurs are smaller, they're about half an inch. Um, brown mermaid stink bug has the two white bands on the antenna. Conspurs does not have the two white bands on the antenna. Um, and the legs on conspurs are light in color with black, it looks like even like specks, you know, like polka dots, where brown mermaid stink bug, their legs are modeled um, with this white band that you see on the legs. So they're, they're, distinct, they're noticeably different from each other um, by these features. The next stink bug that is native, the rough stink bug that is often um, confused with brown mermaid stink bug, how are they different? Rough stink bug does not have the two white bands on the antenna that brown mermaid stink bug has. They have two bands on their legs separated by a black mark in the middle. So as you can see, there's two bands here where brown mermaid stink bug has a wide white band um, that the stink bug, rough stink bug does not have. Now look at the shoulders. Remember I was talking about those smooth shoulders? Uh, rough stink bug has rough shoulders, which is really where it gets its name from. It's jagged edges here um, on the shoulders. And the front of its, what would be considered their face, has two projections here. This is not flat. Brown mermaid stink bug on the right has a very flat, uh, blunt front of the face, where rough stink bug has these two projections uh, not being flat. These are your distinguishing features between the two. Your next one to look at is spine soldier bug. Spine soldier bug, um, again, does not have the two white bands on the antenna that brown marmite stink bug has. And if you look at the shoulders, the shoulders are pointed, um, really, really pointy, where remember brown marmite stink bug has these round, smooth shoulders. Um, and spine soldier bug has very pointed shoulders. Um, so those are the two major features that distinguish the two apart. Um, one thing, a lot of people uh, jump to the idea of they see an insect, it must be causing damage, it must be bad, let's treat, let's apply a pesticide. Um, and something to keep in mind is that this here, the spine soldier bug, and if we go back the rough stink bugs, are not plant feeders, they are predators. They are your beneficial insects. They are stink bugs that are beneficial. These are stink bugs that you want to have in your orchard or in your vineyard um, because they prey on other soft-bodied insects and um, larval stages of moths and butterflies and caterpillars that you have. Um, and so rough stink bug, again, and spine soldier bug are both really good insects to have um, around. So it's not an automatic, oh, I see a stink bug, we need to kill it. Um, there are some good ones out there. So a good resource, if you want to read up more, um, is stopbmsb.org. It has a lot of comparative photos of here's some native species, and this is how it's different from brown mermaid right, stink bug, um, and there, it's a very good resource to check out. So stopbmsb.org. Another resource, of course, is the IPM website uh, for UC Davis um, or UCANR. So it's ipm.ucdavis.edu. Uh, and on there, I'm gonna show you later in our presentation of how to access the information for brown mermaid stink bug um, in a later slide. So on the photo on the right, to show you where in California so far uh, brown marmite stink bug is established in yellow and where it's been detected in gray. And so recently Lake County, um, this turned to gray because it was first, we, we did detect two specimens in May. Um, and so far this year we've also detected two specimens in Mendocino County on top of that. 
So the trapping that I do uh, in my part of the grants that's funded by the Pear Board is uh, Lake County, Mendocino County, but there is also trapping uh, with, with uh, Carrie and, and um, Jalendra. They're doing trapping all outside of Lake and Mendocino counties. So the next insect to talk about, invasive species, spotted lanternfly. Now, spotted lanternfly is not in California yet. So I wanna make that very clear. It has not, a live specimen has not been found and reported um, here yet. But it is believed, and you'll see by some of this information as to why it's believed that it'll eventually get here. And so, this is a plant topper. It's a very large plant topper. It's a one inch by half an inch. And so that's a pretty chunky insect. It's a pretty noticeable. It's not obscure at all. Um, again, native to Northern China and funny thing, it was first found in Pennsylvania in 2014. So it seems to be like the, the avenue in which we have some invasives moving into the US. Um, it was since been documented in New York, Delaware, New Jersey, Maryland, and Virginia. So in, this six, in these six years, it has moved to other states. Um, and it's found, again, both in agricultural and urban areas, very similar to the brown marmorite stink bug, how it uh, invades both areas. Its host range is about 70 plant species, with we know at least 40 of those occur in North America. The photo on the right is showing you them on grapevines. Grapevines is one of their preferred hosts. So this is where it becomes a concern in Lake County um, because brown marmite stink bug also feeds on grapevines, but um, spotted lanternfly would be even worse if it's introduced into California. And we're going to talk about some of those details in a later slide. So again, hosts include grapevines, stone fruits, apple, cherry, blueberry, fig, Pops and woody ornamentals. Preferred host is tree of heaven. Again, uh, these are two things that these species have in common is that they do prefer tree of heaven. And as, as we stand now with research happening on the East Coast, um, they're looking at whether tree of heaven is required for this insect to reproduce or not. There is some belief that it's possible because the adults tend to move to tree of heaven that it might be required by this insect in order to reproduce. Um, but that is unknown fully at this point. Um, so we can't depend upon that idea. Um, but in the future, hopefully they will come to a conclusion um, as whether it is or is not. So the photo on the right, this is what its aggregation looks like. Those are insects on a side of a tree in an urban area. Um, and you know, hundreds of, of spotted lanternfly adults. Um, that are aggregating. So they have a documented uh, one generation per year in Pennsylvania. Nymphs will emerge between April and June and they progress through four immature stages. It goes egg, four immature stages, and then an adult. Um, and those adults emerge in late July. The spotted lanternfly uh, will overwinter as eggs late between August and November and they produce a very large amount of honeydew. Um, and I'm going to show you some photos of what that's going to look like, but honeydew is a substrate for sooty mold. Definitely not something you want in your vineyard or on your grapevines. So each female can lay one to two egg masses um, and they lay 30 to 50 eggs in each egg mass. Um, eggs are laid in these multiple successive rows. So look at the photo at the bottom. They have these multiple successive rows, so rows of eggs right next to each other. And as you can see, this, this uh, opening here is where a nymph has emerged. So this egg has already, um, the nymph has already emerged from the egg. Um, and they cover these eggs uh, with a yellowish brown waxy deposit. So as you can see the photo above, they cover them with this waxy deposit, which makes it very difficult to notice um, them on the side of trees. Um, and inanimate objects. So that is one of the issues with this insect and why we believe it's likely to arrive. Because not only does it lay its eggs on tree surfaces, which, okay, you can look for the trees, um, but also such things as telephone poles, stones, pallets, outdoor furniture, relic, cars, firewood, vehicles, things that can move very long distances. Um, and unbeknownst to the person moving the item, 
uh, not everyone will recognize the photo on top um, when it's say laid against something that's very similar in color. It's not very noticeable, distinguished, and a lot of people wouldn't realize what is that. Um, so this laying of eggs on non-plant items contributes to its wide dispersal ability and the likelihood of its unintentional introduction into the new areas, um, including California. So what is these, let's go, now we know what the eggs look like, we know what the adult looks like, so let's talk about what does the immature stages look like. So you have your first through third instars, and instar is the fancy word for immature stage. So they are this waxy, shiny kind of black with white dots all over. Um, and the fourth instar, which is the stage right before it emerges as an adult, um, is red and black with these white dots. These insects are very noticeable, very, very different than the insects that I've ever seen out in the field. They will stand out and they do stand out. Um, and this is why we're putting the photos in front of people to be, become aware of, hey, look for this. If you see this, report it. This needs to be reported as soon as possible. So here are four photos across showing you what do they look like, the immature stages. Uh, what do they look like um, if you were to come across them? So, um, the fo this photo, the third photo, shows you the egg masses and the egg masses that were covered and some immature stages around the egg masses still. So this is what the immature stages look like and then they emerge as an adult. So the photo on the left, you have your fourth instar um, and then you have adults. When adults are at rest, you don't see the red hind wings that you see on the right hand side. So this is what the in insect looks like when it's at rest. Um, and when you, when you um, disturb the insect, they will flutter their uh, wings and show you the hind wings, which are this noticeable red. So the wings themselves, the four wings are this uh, tannish gray color with black polka dot spots um, and little uh, rectangular bodies at the tip of the wings. The hind wings have this noticeable red area with black dots. Um, the body is very stout, uh, almost like a bumblebee, you know, yellow with the black stripes. Um, and um, one, remember I mentioned that they produce a very large amount of honeydew. Here you have the insect uh, on the left. Um, so this is what a tree looks like um, with the sooty mold that's um, developed on the honeydew. Uh, and here we have a whole bunch of the honeydew that has been uh, released by the insects and then all the fungi, fungi that are growing around. What has been reported is that uh, when someone were to walk up onto an area that has a lot of honeydew like this, there is a smell of fermentation. So they say, oh, it smells like something's been fermenting. Uh, it's a very noticeable scent if you were to walk up on these areas where the insects are. So, uh, one thing these insects have in common is that Tree of Heaven is one of its preferred hosts. Um, and Tree of Heaven is an invasive species itself. Um, it was introduced into the U.S. Uh, via Philadelphia uh, in 1784 and then um, was introduced into the West Coast in the 1850s. It is native to Taiwan and Northeast and Central China. It's a very similar area where these two insects are originally are from. Um, and it's invasive deciduous tree and agricultural forested in urban areas. And its preferred hosts are BMSB and spotted lanternfly. So let's look at the photo on the right. You can see this, this tree was not planted here. It, it popped up out of nowhere. Um, this is the tree uh, in forested areas where it blends in. Um, and you can see th this is, uh, I believe, in rangeland and in someone's backyard. Um, they can grow to be very large trees. Um, and and um, they spread very easily. We're going to talk about some of those details in a couple slides from now. So this tree is very similar in appearance to other trees that are native here and can easily be confused with these other trees. So what, what are these other trees? Uh, black walnut, wing shining sumac, ash, butternut, staghorn sumac. Um, these are some photos of how the leaves are very similar. Uh, and when you're walking up, uh, you might be like, oh, I think that might be Tree of Heaven. And then you go and you realize if you look closer that it's actually not. Um, and that's happened to me in the field early on when they were talking about Tree of Heaven. Like, oh, that looks like a leaf. 
leaves and I went up and I realized, no, it's not the, the tree that I thought it was. So how do we distinguish tree of heaven from these other trees, right? So um, if they're easily confused, what are the features we're looking at? So trees grow rapidly, three to six feet a year, um, up to 50 to 90 feet. So there's a wide range of size, but they grow pretty fast. The tree bark is smooth and greenish in the younger trees. Um, so this isn't exactly the youngest tree, but um, this is what the bark looks like uh, when the tree is past that stage of being green. Um, and it turns to this grayish brown uh, in the older trees, resembling the skin of cantaloupe. So the photo in the bottom, it, re it resembles the skin of cantaloupe, and this is what your, your bark's gonna look like in a mature tree of heaven. So the leaves, so this whole section is considered a leaf, and these are considered the leaflets, and that's important in the next slide, that this whole thing is considered a leaf. So it has a central stem um, with these leaflets that are attached on each side by a short petiole. So as you can see in the photo on the top is a very short petiole here. It has smooth leaf margins. So you can see around here, it's not jagged, it's smooth. Um, um, one to two protruding bumps at the base of the leaflet called glandular teeth. So right here you can see there's one bump and this one has two bumps. So these are called glandular teeth. And with the corresponding gland on the underside of the leaflet. So if you were to flip this leaf over, like we did here, you have this uh, glandular teeth. Here's your gland and then smooth margins. So you can flip them over. You can see the teeth and there'll be a gland on the underside. Um, and one thing very noticeable that when you crush the leaves or you tear the leaf material, it has, um, it has a very offensive and rancid odor. It's been described as cat urine, burnt peanut butter. I've heard rancid cashews. Um, it, it's a very distinct, noticeable, stinky uh, smell um, that the leaves emit. So when you were to break off this leaf, so this portion here, when you break it off of the, the main stem, it creates a heart-shaped to V-shaped heart scar um, where the leaf was broken off. And if you were to cut the twigs, um, they easily break, uh, and they show this brown spongy pith in the center. So there's a large area of pith um, in the center of the twigs. Uh, the trees are dioecious, so they have male trees and they have female trees. Um, and so the female trees are capable of producing over 300,000 seeds annually. That is a lot of seeds. Um, so uh, that definitely contributes their ability to increase in numbers and to spread. The fruit uh, is considered, uh, these the seeds are red, yellow, or green Samaras uh, with one seed. So as you can see in this bottom photo, you have your Samara. Um, it has one seed in the middle and it's surrounded by this winged papery tissue. And this helps in wind dispersal. So when, uh, this, when the Samara breaks off of the tree, it's able to be blown into the wind and in water and dispersed for longer distances. One thing that's important is that this tree can start to bear these uh, seeds when it's only two to three years old. So it does not take it very long to be able to start to uh, increase in numbers um, once, it, once it's sprouting. So what are the issues with controlling tree of heaven? Um, because there is, a, a, some people would jump forward and be like, well, I'm gonna get this off my property and I'm just going to, to you know, cut it all down. Well, there, there's some issues with that. So don't, first of all, don't just cut down your, your tree of heaven. If you find you have tree of heaven um, in your vineyard on, on the property, there is um, some things you really need to consider about um, the, the tree of heaven itself. So they can, the, the established trees can send up root suckers up to 50 feet from the parent tree. So that's a good distance that they can send up root suckers that become new trees. An injured or, uh, or a cut tree of heaven, so if you were to cut tree of heaven, um, you know, at the base, can spread prolific prolifically by sending up these root sprouts. So if you cut it, it responds by sending up root sprouts up to 50 feet around, um, producing more trees, and that's its response to being damaged. And these small, so small root fragments can generate new shoots. So if you try to, say, till all this under, 
Well, now you're just um, allowing those to generate um, new shoots. So mechanical methods such as mowing and cutting by themselves are ineffective. You don't, by themselves, you don't want to do it. Um, so treatment timing and the follow-up treatments for a second year are crucial for success. So it, it is a commitment. If you want to get rid of the tree of heaven, you have to commit not just for that initial treatment, you have to do follow-up treatments and come back the next year also to make sure that what you did was successful and, and, and usually have to retreat. Um, so it's very important before you take this on that you know what you're taking on and you're willing to follow through because you can actually cause more of an issue by trying to get rid of it and not following through um, the following year. So one of the things about Tree of Heaven is that it releases these um, chemicals that can prevent establishment and inhibit growth of native trees nearby. So it, it um, is able to prevent other species from competing with it, growing near it and competing with it. Um, it's a high pollen producer and source of allergy in some people, and so for some people that is an issue. Um, it can cause skin irritation with direct contact. So, um, PPE, so gloves and, 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 um, and, and uh, long sleeve shirts and pants should always be handled and wash your hands after. Um, because in rare cases, uh, it has caused inflammation of the heart muscle um, that, from exposure to sap through broken skin. So if you're removing anything by hand, you definitely want to make sure you're wearing gloves and that you're covered and you wash everything very well afterwards. So hand pulling of young, young seedlings is effective if the soil is moist and the entire root system is removed. Remember those root suckers, I'm sorry, remember if you break off uh, pieces of the root, they can send up shoots themselves. So you want to make sure that your entire root system is removed in the, in the um, young seedlings that you find. Root suckers, which can look just like seedlings, cannot be removed this way because they're connected to the main tree. Um, again, PPE should be used whenever there's direct contact. Target, so if you want to remove Tree of Heaven, the goal is to target the, the root system with a systemic herbicide. Um, and that should be done at least 30 days prior. So target the roots with systemic herbicide and you apply this in mid to late summer. So it's extremely important, that's why it's underlined, and that's July to mid-October. And the reason being is that if you, applications outside this window of time are not effective because they target the above ground growth and not the root system. And you need to target the root system to kill the root system to be able to remove the trees successfully. successfully. So um, in, in uh, July to mid-October, your, your, um, your photosynthesis are, are moving, you're moving down into the root system. And therefore, when you apply a systemic herbicide, it's moving down into the root system. Um, outside of that window, it's moving up into your canopy. So you're just gonna kill the above ground and not the below ground part. We need to target the below ground part of the tree. So with that said, uh, cut stumps, herbicide applications promote root sprouts and should not be used. Um, if cutting a tree is necessary, an herbicide application should be made 30 days prior to allow for the treatment to take effect before cutting. Uh, Well-established Tree of Heaven stands are only eliminated through repeated applications and follow-up monitoring for regrowth and subsequent applications are necessary. So this is what they've learned from the East Coast in trying to remove um, this tree. Um, below, from Penn State University. So Penn State University has some great information um, th that is available. Here's a, uh, the URL that is available for you to look further on. They do have this um, breakdown of when to uh, apply treatment and when to cut after treatment. Um, so if you want to learn more, I recommend checking out the, the, the URL that I've listed here. Um, so a great resource for us is the UCIPM website, um, and that is ipm.ucdavis.edu, and you come to this main page. And on this main page, if you toggle the top and identify manage pests and scroll down to exotic or invasive pests and click on that, You'll come to a page that shows brown mermaid stink bug and spotted lanternfly, which I pointed out in red. When you click on there, you can uh, read more information um, on the insect's biology, behavior, uh, treatment options, pesticide applications that are recommended. Um, we don't currently have that for spotted lanternfly because 
uh, treatment recommendations by UC uh, ANR will not happen until an insect is established and, and present. So, but on brown mermaid stink bug, we do have options. Um, and what, what are the organic options and conventional options for control? Another place, if you want to learn more information about spotted lanternfly, is my page is ucanr.edu forward slash ncipm. NC stands for North Coast IPM. And as you can see on the left hand side of the page, is spotted lanternfly. And when you click on this, you come across this newsletter. Um, and in the newsletter is a lot of different photos. Um, it's a two page newsletter that you can print out and post in. Uh, employee uh, rooms where there's a lot of people, people that are working in the field to be able to show them what are the photos to look out for, look out for this insect in the field. Um, oftentimes it is the people that are working in the field um, that are the ones going to be noticing this insect first. Um, this newsletter is in English and in Spanish, downloadable as a PDF that you again can print out and you can post um, to be able to let your employees know what to look for um, and, and um, spread the word. With that, um, let's see, the photo credits. I used a lot of photos in my presentation and these are all the credits um, to the different people that I borrowed their photos from. So, um, this will be in the, the end presentation. And with that, um, again, I'd like to thank the California Pear Advisory Board and the Pear Pest Management Research Fund, which helped make this research possible um, with uh, trapping for brown marmite sink bug in Lake and Mendocino counties. Um, and Rachel Elkins, uh, so our UC uh, California, University of California Cooperative Extension, our partners that we work with on this project is Rachel Elkins, uh, Carrie Wendell Rojas, Jalendra Rajal. Um, these are all advisors um, on the project. Ryan Kiefer is our ag te technician in Mendocino County who changes the traps. Lynn Frazier is our lab assistant in Lake County who changes the traps in Lake County. And special thanks to Chuck Ingalls and Lucia, Lucia Varela who were part of the original um, grant that started this uh, trapping for BMSB in Lake and Mendocino County. Uh, Chuck also worked in the Sacramento um, and Delta area. And with that, um, it's my title and my email address if you have any questions later on. And I believe we have time for questions. Yeah, so if, you, if anyone has questions, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A section. I don't see any right now. Dr. Cron, uh, what time of year do you expect to see uh, brown marmorated stink bug eggs and versus adults? Sure. Um, so they, they overwinter as adults. Um, so you could see adults in the fall and in, in the winter time, they will aggregate on sides of buildings and trees and they tend to try to move into homes where it's warmer. So you're able to find them in your urban areas. Come springtime, they'll be moving into uh, agricultural areas. So you'll see adults then in springtime. Uh, and so I would say late spring and um, in summer, you start to see eggs. Uh, and then your immature stages, and then, then it's mixed. So you'll see adult, the adults will still be present, um, but you'll see the immature stages progress. Um, to become adults eventually in the field. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions at this point. So, um, Doctor, I would like to thank you very much on behalf of the Farm Bureau, the Wine Grape Commission, and Department of Ag. Uh, thanks so very much for bringing this information to our growers here in Lake County so we can uh, be, be prepared um, to spot these. Um, and I guess the final question is if they do spot if there are some questions, do we, who do growers contact? Do they contact sure. UC Cooperative Extension or Department of Ag? So um, if you were to find an insect that you believe is brown marmite stink bug or spotted lanternfly, uh, you should collect the insect if possible into a sealable container 
of some sort. So a Ziploc bag that's able to be sealed, um, Tupperware, a glass mason jar with a lid, um, collect it and bring it into the Ag Commissioner's Office in Lake County. They're able to look at the insect um, and if need be, send off to CDFA for proper identification to verify that yay or nay, um, you have the invasive species or not. Um, and they're also the ones that control um, the, the response to uh, a find of um, a invasive species. So one of the things that if with brown mermaid stink bug, they have a, a interesting thing about their behavior when you think of, oh, how do I collect? Brown mermaid stink bug has a dropping behavior. So if you were to take a cup, I used to collect them with um, Starbucks plastic cups that I'd already finished my drink from. And you put them, you put it underneath, like you come up underneath them, they will drop right into the cup. Because um, uh, it is a way of, of um, getting away from predators is they just drop to the ground. So if you put something underneath, they'll drop literally right into your cup. Um, not either, so both insects have piercing sucking mouth parts. Neither of them bite humans or can bite humans. So you're not concerned about them uh, doing any physical harm to you or, you know, communicating any kind of disease or anything like that. So some people are always concerned about having to handle insects. If you're not able to collect the insect, take a photo um, of what you're seeing. It needs to be a clear photo though. It has to be very detailed, clear photo, good lighting, um, so people can be able to see what you are looking at. Um, what is more ideal, ideal is having the actual insect to identify. Some insects you need to look from different angles, um, and a photo, you know, is not always the best way of doing that. Great. Doctor, we have one more question here. Why shouldn't we treat stumps with a systemic herbicide? So the issue is, is that you cut it first. So it's not, it's not treating with a systemic herbicide. It's the fact that you cut the tree first. And so when you, you cut the tree first, it automatically starts shooting up, the, uh, setting out those sprouts, right? Um, so, so this, this is the, the issue of now you, they can send it up, send them out up to 50 feet and that's in, in, um, 50 feet around. Um, and so you should treat the tree with the herbicide first, allow 30 days to pass and then cut the tree if that is what you would like to do to remove it. But cutting first. Um, the tree responds by sending out these sprouts, which makes it very difficult to actually get rid of the tree at that point. Okay, so with that, uh, doctor, thank you very much for sharing your insights. Uh, oh, we do, yes, we do have one more question. Will this presentation be posted on the Cooperative Extension website? I do know we will be posting it on the commission site. Uh, doctor Cron, will we be having that also on your site as well, or? Um, not that I know of okay. at this point. I believe okay. it is going on the, um, on the, Yep. Yep. We'll be posting it on the Wine Grape Commission site and all attendees will receive a link to it. So hopefully that will um, be able to be used for reference. Okay, so that it, that's it. That wraps our seminar. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Dr. Cron. You're welcome. Great day. <laughs>